Hello, everyone. My name is Sandra Kim, IA's Professional Development Director, and I want to welcome you to the Manufacture Series webinars. Today's webinar titled Soil Moisture, the Most Important Factor for Young Tree Survival is sponsored by Tree Diaper. Tree Diaper is a patented technology featuring slow releasing irrigation, auto recharging with rain and snow, weed control, and protection against salt and extreme weather. For more information, visit www.treediaper.com. I have just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. This session will be recorded and all phones will be muted. This webinar is worth one CEU. A question and answer session will be held at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions, please type them into the question box on your screen. The presenter will address them at the end of the session. Our speaker today is Wei Zhan. Wei Zhan holds a doctorate in engineering from Virginia Tech. He has been doing research and development for the green industry for 10 years. His research areas include watering solutions for landscape plants, plant health, and plant protection against stresses like drought and road salt. His work also provides novel solutions to green stormwater infrastructures for which plants are used for the treatment of pollutants in stormwater. Wei is known as a scientist, educator, and public speaker. Now, without further ado, Wei, please start your presentation. All right, thank you, Sandra, for the introduction. I and mean, then uh, thank you very much for attending this session. Um, I myself is a chemical engineer by training. And then so about 10 years ago, my wife is my uh, course. My wife is the uh, co-founder uh, of this business. And then she wanted to find a way to recycle baby diapers. And she's a chemist. So we wrote a proposal to National Science Foundation for a uh, proposed a new way to recycle baby diapers. And uh, of course, we got funded and they have nothing to do with irrigation or something like that. And then, but we quickly realized that the materials we recycled and we don't have market. We need to develop a new way to use the materials. That's how we develop this technology. And then I didn't know much about plants. And then in the past few years, uh, four or five years, and I have been asked many, many very tough questions about plants. And most of the time, my answer was, I don't know, because I really don't know. And then, well, I didn't. But we didn't stop there, and I, I came back home, I do a search uh, on the internet, or I have some uh, horticultural friends, and I will ask them. And I also run some experiments to find out the answers. And then, so this presentation is uh, a lot, uh, mostly is what I learned in this process. For, the, uh, for example, and this is the email we received uh, almost more than three years ago. It's from Colorado. And then he said, I have a row of uh, oaks that is getting overwatered by the turf grass irrigation. And then is there a product that can protect them from all the turf irrigation? We were, uh, we don't know. What can we do? Well, we did some uh, research and I'm going to address this question later on. So, but before I go to that question, go to that answer, and then we will look at the, the backgrounds about the urban forestry and uh, you know, why the urban forestry, what's the benefits and what the problems. And then we're gonna talk about the, how this technology works and how it solves the issues that we encounter in most of this urban forestry. So 
this is the uh, USDA uh, Forest Service report in 2010. And then it said what the American green infrastructure and then what the urban forestry is. The urban forest will become increasingly critical to sustaining environmental quality and human well-being in urban area. And this is the uh, good news um, that they projected the land mass will grow from 3.5% in 2010 to 8.1% by 2050. So it's more than double in that 40 year period. And then with the massive uh, constructions out there right now, we know this is not, uh, this is not far off if it's not, uh, not more. So the good news, I said this good news is that everybody in this uh, room, in this, uh, uh, in, the, in the audience, in the green industry, have uh, job security. And then with all this ma land mass increasing, and then everybody gonna have a uh, good job security, you have lots of uh, work to do. And well, uh, we all know that this urban area by cutting down the trees, building a neighborhood's roads, it's gonna cause this uh, uh, terrible air quality, heat island effect, all those bad and pollutions, of course. And then we will all have to live through that. That's the bad news. And this is a, a typical, typical uh, planting site of uh, urban forestry. Uh, as, as you can see, lots of concrete, a small box, uh, with uh, with a tree, and then we hope this tree will cool down this street and will do the job. And then, as we all know, it's a little bit underpowered in this case. And then it's uh, just too much of the pollution and then too much of the heat from the con uh, from the concrete going for this tree. But still, uh, and this is uh, another U.S. Forest Service study said. Every dollar spent on planting and caring for a community tree yields the benefits that is two to five times uh, of the investment. It can be cleaner air, lower energy costs, uh, the water quality, stormwater runoff control, and then property values, and then the health of citizens. When some of them you can put a dollar sign on, some of them you cannot. And then one of them is the stormwater. And then we, if you search in the news, you're gonna find a lot of these reports about the EPA fans, EPA settlements with the city about the stormwater runoff. And then if you search your local news, uh, pretty much it's three words, your city name, the river you are nearby, and then the sewage, raw sewage, uh, you're going to find the reports about this raw sewage running into the river, go discharging into the river. And then how do the trees do that? Well, trees will not treat all those sewage, but it will reduce the amount of water going into the, uh, the current uh, wastewater system. That is the combined wastewater and the stormwater system. If you can use the plants, treat this uh, stone water, and then discharge them into the river, you're gonna have less of the this stone water run into the wastewater system. By doing that, you will have much less a problem of overrunning uh, wastewater into the into the river. This is a uh, chart published by Professor Ward Hoyer and Fisher just a few years ago. And then they are talking about the cost and the benefits of the urban forestry um, from the standpoint, this is the schematic, uh, this is a schematic diagram, this is not a real diagram. Uh, this is not the years or months, this is just a schematic um, uh, months. As you can see, this is the benefit, this is the cost. And then the money you put in the maintenance gonna have a, a much bigger return 
when getting onto the metro state and starting doing the uh, doing the work for it. But regardless, you do the maintenance or not. If you look at the first few years, this is the cost, this is the benefit. The cost is higher than the benefit. It's net negative. In order to break even, you're going to come have to come down here, somewhere around here before you can break even. And we all know that city trees have pretty short life. And if you keep redoing, replanting trees in the first few years over and over again, you will never get them to the mature state. You will never get the benefits out of it or the promised benefits out of it. That's what we have seen a lot in this urban area. You just keep replanting, replanting. And then sometimes you have a metro tree, and then some of these smart city leaders will say, oh yeah, we need to cut down the trees for development. Uh, the, the tree protection group may say that, well, it's uh, not a good idea, but they're gonna tell you that, uh, yeah, yeah, so um, we can plant a new tree, right? We can plant a new tree for it. And then, but a new tree will put you around here and then, and then this one, mature tree will give you the, uh, the, the more benefits about that. So let's see. And then what's the problem with uh, this tree planting? And then what do, well, let's look at the fundamental. What do plants need to grow? Um, well, this is the fundamental, most fundamental, elementary school type fundamental. It's the photosynthesis. That's how plants grow. And then you need the water, carbon dioxide, and then sunlight, and then the nutrients. So this is, uh, this is, a. Uh, uh, in the rural media, in the city, in the urban forestry. As you can see, there's a lot, lots of sunlight because whenever we build a road, we do a clear cut. Whenever we build a subdivision, we do a clear cut. I never understand why you have to clear cut when you do a subdivision, and but that's how it is done right now. Um, a road, of course, you have to do a clear cut in order to do that. But then again, it exposes these plants to the sunlight. And then that's a, so we got the sunlight, sunlight a check mark. The carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, well, there have too many reports, but um, how high uh, uh, carbon dioxide level we have right now. Um, it's uh, the highest in almost a million years. And then this is a publication by uh, Arizona State University on mapping the carbon dioxide level. And then the uh, darker lines, the red lines is not the traffic. It's not what you see in a map with the traffic. The darker the color, the higher the carbon dioxide level. And then, so in the city center, in the center of the city, you're gonna have more red lines. Along the highways, you have the more red line. That means the higher um, carbon dioxide level. Well, that's also the places where the urban forestry is. So carbon dioxide, it is, uh, it is there. And then the water. It really depends on how you define the stormwater as a resource or as a waste. This is the uh, rainfall map of the 2018, the water year 2018. And then somewhere has more than 100 inches. And then the vast majority of places have well, 20 inch or more, 20 inch or more rains a year. And then, I mean, that water, if you accumulate every drop, it's deeper than a kid's pool. But then again, if uh, most of this, uh, a city is treated as a weed. They want to get rid of it as quick as possible. And then you don't get to use that. And then in an urban area, remember, <clears throat> there's some space that doesn't allow the water uh, penetrate to the ground. So there's 
the more impervious surface, the more water you got to use. Of course, in the stormwater, uh, the municipal standpoint, the more water needs to be get rid of. <clears throat> the other thing is the nutrients. Uh, lots of the pollutants happen to be also the, the nutrients, like uh, nitrogen oxide. Nitrogen oxide is the perfect nitrogen fertilizer for the plants, but that's a pollutants, and the plants can remove that easily. Some of the minerals, some of these uh, uh, metals can be the uh, micronutrients for the plants. So check, 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 mark. And then yet, this is the typical thing we see around the nation um, for tree planting. And then some of them calling the citizens to help to water their plants. And then some of them that have to drag a long hose or drag a water tank to the uh, long distance to the planting site. You know, if you are a government employee, uh, things may be much easier for you. For example, tapping into a uh, fire hydrants to uh, to to refill your uh, water tank. But if you are part of business, things may not be that easy. Sometimes can be very expensive. For example, just because you have a landscaping business, you become the uh, prime suspect for the water theft from these uh, fire hydrants. And then yet, and then every uh, urban forest tree have a very high price tag. And then this is in New York City, the payment per tree, and this is adopt a tree program. And then it's a $2,150. And then it is based on the actual tree planting cost incurred uh, by New York City parks. And then <clears throat> this enrichment, the 2013 price is $256 per tree planted only. And I'm gonna show you why it's a $256 of waste uh, of the money just shortly. This thing in San Francisco. He said that it's 2000, similar to New York City. And then this is the whole, it calculated, is it going to cost around the $500 for planting and another $500 for watering for three years. At least they are watering. Well, at, at least they, they get it right, uh, watering for, um, for some time. And then this is uh, in Richmond, Virginia. <clears throat> this Richmond, Virginia, and then these are the trees planted in the root media, $256 per tree planted. And then this is on a Google map uh, on April, 2014. <clears throat> if we fast forward to August, we see these trees are dying. And there's one tree that look like it's still alive, but if you focus into it, you will gonna see it's a weed. The water bag has not been refilled or it's not, not used properly. And then fast forward to April to April 2015, all the trees had di have died. And then this is the dead trees that have been removed in July 2015. And then you see the green dots, the green dots are $256 each. And then that's why I said it's to the waste. And the reason this is a, a grainer is because the soil is terrible. And then the little bit of uh, good soil they moved in from the nursery made this uh, a better a grain of dust on there. And then this is a 2019, still have nothing there. This is another site in Richmond. And then this is uh, off I-95, a very busy highway. And then this is I-95, and then the other side have a chain link fence. So as you can see, getting water to this side is uh, not easy. And then this is another, another one uh, for me. And then so uh, the, uh, this highway that when, when I was there, it was not very busy, but the typical very busy street. So uh, John Palmer, uh, uh, master arborist 
and then from Ohio, he trademarked this thing called deforestation by design. So he said the design and installation of plant material in violation of the known plant care standards resulting in predictable premature decline or death. And then so, so what are the main challenges to make a city tree survive and thrive? What are the true problems? And why are these trees cost too much? Are there better ways to save taxpayers' money? And then we, let's look at the, uh, the plants. What do we need to do for newly planted trees? Now, we all know that plants are tough. Uh, they have been on the planet for millions of years. And then this is a picture. This is a picture of uh, Chernobyl, uh, the nuclear disaster site. And a recent year, there are a lot of uh, photographers to go in and take pictures. And then you can see when people retreat, the trees take over this place. And then even in places that you will never expect a tree to grow, and then the, these trees grow. So trees are really tough. But a tree don't plant, but trees don't move naturally or typically they don't move in the uh, in, in the natural environment. And then when we move these uh, trees to the planting side, and then either is dug up, uh, either they are dug up from the farm or the container grown. I mean, they will have to lose, lost their um, roots, or they lose the irrigation system that uh, are feeding them every day. So, for example, this is uh, this is the tree uh, on the farm, and then th this analog is really good. And my friend came up with this, and then said uh, this uh, the bowl of this wine glass is the canopy, and then this uh, the this stone is the a tree trunk, and then this is the base, and the plate is the real uh, root uh, structure. But most of the time, most of the time we chop up only the base of it. So you, you look, this tree lose the majority of its root system on the farm before it's moved to uh, the planting site. So that's why. And then they need the care. They need uh, intensive care in the first few years in order for them to survive. But there are many reasons for trees and plants die. And then and if you get into the old age, that's the ultimate goal. And then that, that will be good. And then, but there's a few things that we can do to, uh, to help them to survive. And then that we can do a little bit to get much more uh, kind of um, a payback. So one of them is the soil moisture management. And then we're going to talk about the uh, soil compaction, insufficient soil water, if we have a time. Of course, the other things about the soil uh, damage, and we will get to that as well. So the improper Soil moisture, this is the most common reason for tree decline deaths, especially for the young, newly planted trees. And then it is also an issue that can be easily managed. Uh, let's look at the water options for trees. Well, the number one is rainfall, it's free. And then there's a irrigation system, that's uh, what this organization about, the Irrigation Association. And then there's also the manual water and the slow release uh, watering. So let's look at each option. Rainfall is the, the definitely the most uh, affordable one, and then, but it's very unpredictable. And then you never know when and where you're going to have the drought. And then with regard to the newly planted trees, they need the uh, first uh, three to five years. And then you're going to kind of guarantee that you're going to have a situation of a drought uh, situation there. And then, so the next one is the irrigation. Um, we have to say that most, the vast majority of the irrigation system are designed for turf, not designed for trees, just like what 
uh, the, my friends from Colorado wrote to us in 2017 that uh, he saw the water the trees um, because of turf. And then if you do water the uh, use the irrigation system to meet the need of the trees, you're going to have you're going to overwater the turf. But most of the time, and also in that Colorado situation, that they actually shallow water. The shallow water of the turf irrigation system almost killed that tree. That was the reason. I'm going to get to it later on. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, the, the next option is the manual water. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of the worst. I mean, uh, uh, it's uh, not cost not cost prohibitive. Actually, it's a very cost effective at the beginning, but it's least predictable. When you have a drought in your in your, in your city or in your region, it most likely is a widespread drought, and then you're gonna have that uh, uh, shortage on labor, shortage on the on the equipment, and then to get the water to it. And then um, the, the sure far way. It, it, it's sure, sure far away to kill trees to make a human uh, responsible, right? So, and it's either way too much or way too little is uh, kind of almost guaranteed. So the next thing is uh, the slow release irriga uh, irrigation system. And then there's a, most of these, for example, the water bags, uh, uh, you will have to still have to refill them. There's still a human, uh, um, uh, factor in there. And then tree dropper is the one that will charge up with uh, rainwater and then slowly release it. Actually slow release to uh, to have a good soil moisture but no not over water. So let's look at some of these uh, uh, the water water bag cases. This is in Richmond, Virginia. <clears throat> And then in 2017, August 8th, we have uh, one inch rain, the tree looks bad. And then four days later, this tree getting worse, and then we had one and a half inch rain that day. And then as you can see, there's a, there's a, still have a raining that time when I take that picture. So the reason is that the bag behave like an umbrella. And then, and then of course, nobody refill the bag. I mean, if you are the boss, you tell your uh, guys to refill the bag in the middle on a two and a half inch rain. They're gonna laugh their heads off right in front of you. And, but if you don't refill the bag, it doesn't function. And this is my friend from Commerce City, Colorado said, water bags are only as good as the whole often staff put water in them, which as we can say, usually results in dead trees. So, but, no, so, but, how often or how long time should we water and then how much water should we give to the trees? I mean, uh, this is a research showing that newly planted trees need, need water for two to five years. And I, uh, most contracts are written with the one year warranty. And then, as you know, this one year warranty have nothing to do with the tree establishment. It's a more of the warranty of the uh, the workmanship and then planting material themselves. It has nothing to do with the tree establishment. In order to recover the uh, the amount of root loss uh, when digging out of the uh, digging out of the farm, it takes a much longer time than one year to get established. And then so. Um, but then again, two to five years. And then typically you said that's the one inch per, one year per inch of caliper. And then, but, so let's show you an example of why this one year warranty is not enough. And then this, I already showed you a picture of this site. And, but this is uh, in in downtown Richmond area. This is the 64 and the 95 mergers there. And on the roof side, that's, uh, this is what they're choosing to do. Uh, a landscaping project and then on this area. This is the August 2013, this Google map image. If you go on Google map right now, you will see the same thing. So this is April 2014. 
This is April 2014. As you can see, the trees have been planted. Uh, they uh, over the over the uh, dormer season, and then one year later, this is April 2015, the trees are looking good, and they have been one year past, more than one year past. So the contractor has fulfilled the warranty obligation, and then they uh, they they're okay. They are good, good to go. And then in January 2016 is two years, and then the trees are still look good. But the question is, are these trees established? May 2017, three years have passed, and then again the question is, are these trees established? And this is July 2017, and then you start seeing these trees starting to die, and then, and then we know they have not been established. And then the good thing that is uh, in Richmond, Virginia, and then the dead trees can come back. This is June 2018, and then the dead tree have come back. Well, except that the two, the rest are smaller. Yes, they did replant it. And then the contractor did get paid twice for doing this job. And then some other time, I bet this contractor got paid only once for doing the job twice. So really depending on which. So what, this is my own picture I showed you earlier. And then this is the US drought map right before I take this picture. And then this is uh, Richmond, Virginia region. And then this is we didn't get a real drought. We only have abnormally dry weather for some time. The problem with drought is that you never know where it's going to be. And then you, uh, it's a moving target. Somewhere, sometimes, sometimes, everywhere, somewhere, all the time, you're going to have a drought. And then it's hard to prepare for it. And then so people uh, develop these uh, water prescriptions. Uh, for people to water trees. And then this is what I found online and just a few of them to show you how many are there. And then one of them was developed by Alan Seward, uh, Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And then when I asked him uh, how he developed this, he said the volume calculation was based on one inch rain. And then, but the volume was not studied to his knowledge. And then, I look in the literature, I found that the Professor Ed Gilman from University of Florida uh, have this have his website about the two inch oak trees in southern climates need two to three gallons of water every day. And his work is the most widely cited reference around the nation. I'm talking about people from Iowa, Kansas, or Pacific Northwest, and citing his work to for developing of their own water prescription. I mean, in his on his website, it's very clear: two inch oak trees, thousand climates in the two to three gallons of water every day. And then the, there's one condition he didn't state in the, in there. That's the sandy soil in Florida. And then yeah, people from Pacific Northwest. Uh, cite this reference to develop their own uh, literature, uh, their own water prescription. So a few years ago, I met uh, Professor Ed Gilman, asked him the question, but how much of this water wasted? And then he said, good question. It's going to take about $1 million, 10 students, and 10 years to find out. I said, how about we start some work right now? He said, I retired two years ago. Well, it, that, that doesn't answer my question, doesn't solve my puzzle, of course. So I look into the literature further and I found this uh, uh, article by EPA. It's estimation of the irrigation efficiency. Um, as you can see, surface irrigation can be as low as 50%, accurate can be as low as uh, uh, 24%. And then sprinkler system, maybe as low as 50%. And this is for, for agriculture uh, field. And then when you have an agriculture field, if you the water overruns from one row to another row, that's not a loss, that's still on the field. How about this one? How much of this water wasted? 
Then one thing I'm pretty sure this guy was not paid to water trees. His, his performance is not related to the tree uh, uh, health. His performance really the how many tanks water dump on the road every day. And then, of course, that didn't answer my question. And, uh, and I found this uh, article by Professor Todd Dawson when he was still at the Cornell University. They did the work that they measured the sap flow of a tree by mounting sensors around the trunk. And then they connect, they, they, they convert this water mount onto the plant level, on, on the stand level. And then what they found is that uh, during the during the growing season, it may need as only 2.2 inches per month in the hot summer days. And then average during the growing season is about less than two inches per month. So if we use this average, um, and then we're gonna find that for a 30 inch root ball that will be a two inch tree, we will need less than six gallons per month. This is per month, not per day, not per week. Okay, you see that uh, this area, this New York, this uh, upstate New York is not represented. Then let's use August, uh, August data. August is August. The temperature between New York City and Miami is only 10 degree very high difference. So in August, it's a 2.2 inches per month. And if we would convert into for a 30 inch rootable, it's less than seven gallons. Again, this is the per month, not per day or per week. And then so this gives us a baseline of how much water we need. And then if we consider uh, the losses in the water prescription, and then we need to consider the site, uh, the uh, soil type, the climate, uh, the irrigation efficiency in there, and then that's not what the uh, tree want, tree need. That's the, uh, the that's the loss, and then sometimes about the computation as well. So this is a uh, plant available water, and then that shows you where the water goes. And then, uh, no matter how much water you dump onto the road system, and then you are not going to make all the water usable because the when you have this great gravitational water around, you want to drain them away as quick as possible. You are hoping that you will get in between the field capacity and the wilting point, and then for most of the time. So. So I have been asking the question, is this a grain, a grain dash line possible? That's raising the field capacity and then increasing the plant available water envelope. Is this possible? Well, of course, if you have the traditional way, it will not because you don't want the, uh, the water amount be above the field capacity that will drain. And then, so the idea that can we combine this, the, uh, use the um, excess stormwater in the cities and then combined with the slow release irrigation. Instead of tell people how much water to water per day, per week, and we tell people to check the soil moisture instead. So this is the idea that I came up and that is uh, uh, when you have the rain or irrigation water come down, you have this excess water. This water will be wasted regardless, uh, most of the time. But with this solid water with air pockets, um, air pockets is important. Because it prevent the uh, root rot problem, prevent the depletion of the air uh, from the root system. And then, so you chart it up by osmosis. And then when the soil dries, it pulls, uh, the dried soil pull the water out by osmosis. So you maintain a good soil moisture. I mean, to charge up the excess water is really, uh, really something that um, I use to explain how this works. I mean, if you have a urogenic system, you know you have to put a backflow preventer. The backflow preventer prevents you from taking the excess water back up. Well, there's a reason to do that, of course, from the to prevent the contamination of the drinking water system, but then again, there's no way for you to use a irrigation system to pick the water up other than this uh, solid water with the air pockets. 
And then I showed you one block. This is the, um, the north block of this street early to show the dead trees. And then the south block on the same street, and then we installed this solar water in 2013. And then this is the April 2014 uh, Google map showing this block and this block. Uh, this block I already showed you earlier. So, well, except that there's only one water bag left, the rest got stolen. I and mean, then just a standard operation in the city um, to use a water bag. There's also the standard operation around there that people will steal it. And then, so this is uh, July 2014, all the trees looking good, these trees are dying. And then this is uh, 2015, the trees have been dead. And then this tree is still there. This is July 2015, the dead tree removed here, the tree is still doing good there. This 2016, this is my own picture. <clears throat> This is 2018, remember 2017 uh, drought, it caused the tree to decline, but they are still alive. And by the way, the soil is terrible there, as, as I showed you earlier. And then no tree there, of course. So we checked the soil moisture in the first four months when we, after we start the project. And uh, underneath this uh, uh, tree diaper, the solid water system, we found the soil moisture uh, always about 3.6. And then as a comparison, and it's this water bag, we never see it above 3.5. So that's uh, that's uh, the cause of the live versus death difference. This is the case study in Denver, uh, Colorado area. This is a sports park, you know, there's a irrigation system. There's these trees on the edges uh, of this. Uh, park and then in, on the parking lot. And then this is the uh, the image uh, that came in with the email we received in 2017 talking about the irrigation system uh, is killing this tree because of the overwatering the tree. But later on, we learned that it's not the overwatering that killed the tree. It is the shallow water that was killing the tree because the soil moisture at the four inch deep was only 10 to 20%. And then after the uh, tree diaper was installed, four, uh, three weeks later, the soil moisture at the four inch deep was 50 to 70%. This tree was saved from this uh, irrigation system, the shallow water over there. And then this is the one that I showed you earlier about it. Uh, and then we got the permission to replace the water bag with the tree diaper. We cover with the mulch, and we never water it again, of course. Uh, this is the one week after we replace this uh, water bag, and you see these trees coming back. And this is the whole year after, uh, after we do the replacement. And then we, it has a, a five week period, period with only a quarter inch rain, and the tree was doing great there. And this is one year from that time. This is another case that is this in the backyard, um, uh, my friend. And then, you know, this is a tree, this is a turf. They have a irrigation system. They have uh, six zones of uh, irrigation system. And then zone five was what I asked my friend to stop the irrigation system so I can do, a, do an experiment. And then this is... Uh, this is the chart. This is 2018 when I did it. And then we stopped the irrigation system and then we put this tree diaper on, on after two days after installing the uh, sensor monitoring system. And then this is, the, this is the control area. As you can see, the soil moisture quickly come down and then it's July and August in, in Houston. So it's really, really hot. And then there's a rain event, as you can see. In the control, the soil moisture goes up really, really high, and then, of course, come down quickly. And then and this tree diaper, it doesn't go up much and because the water is saved in the tree diaper, it stabilizes it. 
Where unfortunately, after three weeks, I put it in there and then the sensor was damaged by the lawnmower. And I, I have not be able to get go back to Houston to redo the the system. But I may be able to do something this year and then at a, a different site. So yes, so there's a green dash line is possible. And uh, I want to talk about some other stretch like a root of thought. Um, and then I hope I have a time. If not, we can stop here. And, but so the other stresses, like uh, the root thought. The reason I pick up a root thought is because it's a uh, it's a it's a problem for the urban forestry. And then this is a typical site you you probably see around uh, this year around. And then this uh, spread too much salt on it. It's way too much salt that I need. And then, well, of course, if you don't use salt, you're gonna have other problems. And then salt is like the lubricant of the modern life during the winter. And if you don't have salt, you're going to be like uh, uh, some of the thousand uh, cities that are going to, uh, the whole city is paralyzed. And then this is the Michigan, I had talked about that is uh, the uh, Michigan is getting salty. And then, uh, this Appalachian State University have an article talking about to sort or not to sort. I don't know how to answer that, but I can tell you the sort too much. This is uh, in their um, in their picture showing how much salt left over after all the snow had been gone, and this how much. You know where the salt goes, especially on this road and the parking lots. It goes goes into this green stone water infrastructure. Are going to be uh, sometimes can be deadly to these uh, uh, plants because they are not uh, suitable to handle the salt. Uh, many of them, and then this is uh, in Fairfax County. This is uh, uh, the Capital One headquarters. This is the uh, McLean Metro Station, and then on this parking lot, they use this plant box, a tree box, to treat the stone water. The treat the first flush. And then before you start to the river and then that. And then so this is uh, what I see in 2019 with data tree. And then I didn't know why, but this is another time I stopped by and then this is how much salt they put right in front of a tree wheel. And they hope the tree will be able to uh, not become a pickles. So how to get rid of the salt? There's not much way, not many different ways to do other than drain the salt away. Drainage, uh, because salt, you cannot really uh, break it down or make it into something else. Sodium chloride is the most common salt. It doesn't break it down to any other things. That's it. And then you may use a coarsing salt to replace uh, the sodium from the exchange side, the soil exchange side, to make it easier to leach out, but still had to leach out. The, there's the one problem. When the irrigation system is needed to wash the salt out, the system typically is not available. Uh, when they become available, they typically is too late to save it. So I did this study in my backyard to show you how tree dapper can help to uh, solve this issue. And then I'm going to show you this. Uh, other than this, uh, the dry the soil, pull the water out. There's another way to get the water out. That's the salt. Salt will push the water out uh, quickly. And then this water will, uh, we think this water will help to save the, um, save the plants. So I did a study in my backyard on how this sort can help. And this is the, uh, this is the setup with 16 plants, and then eight of them without the solid water, say with that tree diaper, eight of them with it. And then some of them with, uh, we do the uh, applied salt only on the root zone, the other half we add the salt onto the leaves. So I'm gonna show you the results instead of uh, I'll go through the whole thing. Let me see. I'm gonna show you only this because I think I'm running out of time. 
So this is the results. And this is after 35 ounce of salt. When I take this picture, they are still alive. This is the one with tree leper. And this is the one without, and it was killed uh, with 31 ounce of salt. The one we did air spray, and I all of them killed in, at 21 ounces. And these trees we eventually got killed at 39, 60, and 70 ounces of salt. And then, but um, this is what I'm trying to say that tree diaper can help solve the salt issues when your irrigation system is not available. So I want to mention one more thing before we get into the questions. That is the weather and the climate. And then, so this is the USDA hardiness zone and of the United States. And then this is a 9A, this is Houston, this is San Antonio, and then this is uh, Northern Florida, this is 9A, a zone 9A. So the majority of the US is in zone eight or lower. So when you have a zone eight or lower, you going to expect a minimum temperature every year being 15 degree. So if you ask the question whether you should winterize your irrigation system, that should be a must to do. And then if you are in 8B or 9A, you may take your chances. Um, in the past few years, you have a pretty good chance of getting away from doing it. And then if you are in 9B to 10A, maybe optional of course the other one is just uh, uh, too warm you don't need to do anything and then this is the temperature of yesterday morning and then this is the u.s and this is a houston remember they are in the zone 9a and then they got a single digit temperature right around there so my friend Lee there said uh, they they did get a last minute winterization winterization of their um, of their system, but many of them probably didn't get a chance to do. You're gonna see lots of uh, broken pipe around this region, and then you're gonna have a lot of business going on there. But this is the other thing. This is the drought map right now. This is uh, the most recent drought map published out there. And then if you combine the temperature map and uh, and this drought map, you're going to see many, many, many area that is uh, supposed need an irrigation system and you don't have it. You, you don't have that irrigation system available. So tree diaper definitely can help bridge this uh, um, period and then make, make the plant to survive it and before the irrigation system is turned on again. So with that, I'm going to uh, see if there's any questions uh, that need to be answered. Sandra? Yes, thank you for the presentation. We do have a few questions. The first yes. one is, in the cost benefit graph, does it make sense to remove a tree in decline and replant with new before costs exceed benefits? Uh, that's a very good question. I would say you have to say uh, uh, my friend that is uh, Arbus Gordon Ma, is a, he's a consulting Arbor. He said uh, the the benefits of the tree, most of the benefits of trees in the leaves in the canopy. And then if you think the canopy still is larger than a newly planted trees, I would say still keep it uh, for some uh, till till it declined to a certain point that is. Uh, even smaller than newly planted trees. And then, but if you still have the uh, the canopy that's larger than typical newly planted trees, I would say keep it. Sometimes you may be able to save it with some uh, uh, with some of these uh, techniques. You may be able to save it and make it revive it uh, again. And then it may kind of recover some of this canopy. Okay, thank you. There are other questions. Um, the next one is, has there been any studies regarding effectiveness within the Pacific Northwest Seattle Portland area? Yes, we have a case study shown there. And they, uh, there are several cities uh, or customers, and I don't have uh, that, that list on my this slideshow. But uh, we have a case study. We have an endorsement. 
and then uh, from the from the uh, different people there. So yeah. Okay, great. Okay, the next question is: As the tree matures and the root system expands how do you get water to the entire root system under the and beyond um most of trees planted into this uh, urban forestry should be a native plant or at least uh, can adopt to the to the environment and then in other way to say uh, if the tree, if you put a tree that is uh, uh, from the east coast to Arizona, and then you should expect that water that tree for its entire life, if it's not uh, from this uh, Arizona area. Then, but if you have a tree that is from Arizona area, then you either going to it, it should be established after the establishment period. And then it should be able to extract um, enough water for it to survive. But if it's not, that's not the case, then you need an irrigation system for it. And then I know the whole southern um, California is not, it used to be a desert, it's because the Colorado River that made that, uh, um, made that the water from there to make that uh, being, uh, being livable. So in those cases, you probably need the irrigation system all year long. And then tree dapper will help in the winter months, but then again, you will need to, you will definitely need the irrigation system as well. Next question is, is the product available in Canada? Yes, we ship to Canada and we also have distributors in Canada. Next question. If the tree diaper dries out, does it become hydrophobic or difficult to rehydrate? No, it's, it's not. And typically, I would say uh, the hydrophobic uh, issue is typically happening to mulch. And the mulch is a different structure and then, uh, from, the, uh, from the tree diaper. And then tree diaper is filled with the uh, the super absorbent polymers that can charge up easily. Um, I would say the dried state become hydrophobic is from the mulch. Some of the mulch getting hydrophobic when it's dry, but tree diaper doesn't. And then, but then again, we do suggest people cover with the mulch. And if the mulch become hydrophobic, then that, that may be an issue. We do suggest people to turn around their mulch every year. Uh, but I know that's not always done, so. Next question is, can tree diaper be auto refilled? Yes, uh, most of the time it's refilled by rain, snow, ice, uh, whatever comes from the sky. So uh, I would say most of our customers east of Mississippi River was, was able to get rid of what uh, eliminate water in the last five years. But I have to say last of five years, they have not, they didn't have a severe drought like the west part of the country. In west part of the country, and then if you combine with the irrigation system, that will take care of the shallow watering of the irrigation system. If uh, you have a uh, area that without the irrigation system, this can definitely reduce the, uh, the number of time to water, tree down, to water the trees. So. Next question is, how does the tree diaper encourage the extension of the root system for the establishment of the tree? Um, number one, the root ball, if the root ball is a 30-inch uh, is, is um, root ball, we will suggest a tree diaper of 40, 80 inch. And then if the root ball is about 20 inch, we will suggest a uh, tree diaper about 36 inch. And then so in order to say this is for a tree before establishment, and then this encourages the root growing outwards instead of growing inside the root ball. Um, I know a lot of this uh, product that you water right onto the root ball and it doesn't do a lot encouraging the root growth. For the established trees, and we have seen that the water in the tree diaper is not the majority source for the tree, so it doesn't encourage the, uh, the, the, the girdling root inside. And, then, and if you can send me an uh, email, I will uh, be happy to send you a picture of 
which we planned in 2013, uh, 2014, and then five or six years later, and then we live up, we don't see the tree, the roots girdling around. So I'm not sure I answered that question right or not, but if not, then you can send me an email and then I, I'll read, address that question uh, separately. We do have a few additional questions, but we're out of time today. So what I can do is send Wei um, the remaining questions and hopefully he'll be able to answer and I'll be able to send it to the attendees today. So uh, I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, don't forget to check, our, check out our website for upcoming webinars during the year. Big thank you to Wei for sharing his knowledge with us today and to Tree Diaper for sponsoring the webinar. Again, if you have any questions that we did not answer, I will um, forward them to Wei and I will forward his answers to everyone here today. Thank you again and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.